Ephesians chapter 5. Now, when you go through these verses on the Holy Spirit of God, you need to ask yourself, you know, I mean, really, I mean, does the Holy Spirit really exist? Is the Holy Spirit in me? Uh, how do you know that? Well, you know that because the Bible tells you that. And what are you supposed to do? You're supposed to believe what the Bible tells you about yourself, about what's in you, about what's going on. Here in Ephesians chapter 5, and uh, once again we are covering this because it's important to know about Thanksgiving, verse 18 through 20. It says, And be not drunk with wine, wear in excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks, how much? Always. For what? For all things unto God and the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the Holy Spirit is a spirit of thanksgiving. The Holy Spirit wants to fill us, and if it fills us, we won't have to worry about thanking God, because we'll be thanking God. And if the Holy Spirit's in there filling us, we won't have to worry about any other kind of music, or hymns, or any kind of a spiritual thing going on, because we'll know it'll be Holy Spirit. And... Uh, that is a big help to us if we remember that. That's the Holy Spirit we want, not these other spirits. And uh, also in Romans chapter 8, so it's, it's uh, last week we talked about the Holy Spirit with worship and praise and how he uh, helps us there, helps us in everything. Anything holy, anything right, the Holy Spirit helps us in. But also he shall quicken the believer's body. If you go to Romans chapter 8, <clears throat> what does that mean? Well, it means make it alive. Romans chapter 8, and uh, let's see, verse 11, the Bible says this, the Bible says, But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit, once again, that dwelleth in you, in you. And that's where the Holy Spirit's at, it's in you. And uh, the other verse uh, would be 23 of uh, Romans 8. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within, within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of the body. So these things are inward. The Holy Spirit's inside, inward. And... Uh, don't forget that. In relationship to Jesus Christ, we covered a lot of this with the Lord uh, when we were studying Jesus Christ. And, uh, but the Holy Spirit we're talking about, and He has this relationship uh, to Jesus Christ. And we, I'll just go through some of these quickly. You don't have to turn to them. But we know that He was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Luke one thirty five says, And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And we don't want to forget that, that that was an act of the Holy Spirit of God coming upon the Virgin Mary. Was Virgin Mary a, a part of Adam's seed? Sure. No, no doubt in my mind she was part of Adam's seed. Uh, so what does that mean if she's part of Adam's seed? That means she was a sinner, and uh, just like we are. For sin passed upon all men, for all have sin, and it all started in the garden with Adam's sin. So she had an outside sinful uh, body, and that's why the Bible specifically talks about the Holy Spirit overshadowing her. Uh, that's why it talks about the blood of Jesus Christ being God's blood. That means every cell that was produced, everything that came on him was part of that God blood because, you see, uh, the life is in the blood. Uh, everything that we know about in our digestive system and everything and the way it works, it all takes different parts of the food and everything and it gets it in the blood because the blood goes throughout the whole body. And um, so this is a miracle in itself, just as it was because she was a virgin, virgin. And uh, all this took place uh, in relationship to the Holy Spirit of God. And don't forget that, because if you try to uh, understand it any other way besides God, it's not going to fly. That's why uh, the world uh, thinks it's a hoax, thinks it's a farce, because they don't believe in a virgin birth. Amen? They just don't do it. I mean, they don't, they don't, they don't. And you're not going to convince them. But I know this, that uh, being saved, uh, I, you don't have to convince me of anything. I just believe it happened just exactly the way that happened. I've got no doubts. I'm not skeptical at all about understanding about the blood, understanding about who God is. 
Also, Jesus Christ, in relation to the Holy Spirit, he was anointed with the Holy Ghost. In Acts 10.38, it says this, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And many, many verses are with that, anointing. Uh, after all, the word Christ, when you, when you, when you think of the word Christ, the, the name, the designation of Jesus, they said Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus. Christ means anointed. He was the anointed one. So you see, when a Jew understands that, so when they were calling him Jesus, then he was just Jesus because there's other Jesuses around. But when they called him Jesus Christ, the Jew cringed because that brought them back to the Old Testament and they were thinking about the Messiah because the Messiah was the anointed one, you see. And uh, when you go on your own, you study that and you go to Isaiah 61 when it talks about he hath anointed me to preach to the captives and so on and so forth. Uh, that's an Old Testament reference to the Messiah. So, and the Jew knew this, so that's why it made the Jew even hate the Christian even more, because they were claiming that this Jesus was the Messiah. And when Jesus was here, he claimed himself he was the Messiah. But we did a lot of that with the uh, study of Christology, and we're into this pneumatology now just to study the Holy Spirit. We're just showing you the connection between the Holy Spirit and the um, relationship to Jesus Christ when he was conceived of the Holy Spirit, he was anointed of the Holy Spirit, and we know that he was led by the Spirit because in Matthew 4, 1, uh, that's a famous verse for Christians to really try to understand. It says, And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness. And we heard a lot of teaching and a lot of preaching on this, but I'm telling you what, that, that's something to really think about, that he was full of the Holy Spirit. When he was full of the Holy Spirit, then he was led to be tempted of the devil. Amazing thing. And uh, if, see, if you're full of the Holy Spirit and you're being tempted, you've got a whole lot more ammunition. A whole lot more ammunition. But when you're full of the Holy Spirit, you're also more sensitive to spiritual things. And that could be in the other realm, too. But God has to lead you there. You see, you won't be just... Uh, if you're full of the Holy Spirit, you're not walking into trouble with the devil. You're not cussing the devil out. You're not spitting on him. You're not even thinking about it. God would have to lead you there. And uh, there's a lot of times God will lead you there. And um, so he's led with the Spirit. And the Bible also says that uh, when, we, when we know about that being in the devil uh, thing, there's also reference to the same thing in Luke 4, 1. And Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost, uh, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness. So he was led by the Spirit. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. This is Jesus Christ we're talking about. And he also accomplished his ministry in the power of the Spirit. And that's Luke 4, 18 and 19. Luke 4, 18 and 19. He accomplished his ministry in the power of the Spirit. Amen. Amen, Brother Bill. Amen. And see, the reason why I'm saying all this is because if you could just get in your mind for a minute, uh, the manhood of Jesus Christ. We know he was God manifest in the flesh, but remember, he was 100% man. So a lot of these characteristics that we're seeing, that's why I started reading about if uh, Jesus Christ was, uh, rose again from the dead the third day according to the scriptures, then that same spirit is in us. And the Bible says, as we just read, that we'd be quickened. Our mortal body be quickened and raised again. You see the connection between us and Christ? It's that same Holy Spirit. So the same Holy Spirit leads us. The same Holy Spirit fills us. And uh, the same Holy Spirit will accomplish our ministry down here. Uh, see, people have this idea that they think, well, if they're not preaching or if they're not a pastor or a missionary or something, that they don't have a ministry. And that's garbage. We know that from way back. We heard enough preaching, Brother Bear, other people. Uh, God's given you the ministry of what? Reconciliation. I mean, that, what's greater than reconciliation? Getting two people that are at odds against one another and bringing them together and, and peacefully. I mean, that's just a good uh, ministry anyway. Uh, that's a counseling ministry. That's a lot of times you'll have to be at work or you have to ask God for wisdom when people are arguing, even mad at you, and you've got to know how to reconcile people. But the greatest reconciliation is for you to get somebody to the Lord Jesus Christ to understand that he made peace with God. See, he gets the sinner's hand and he gets God's hand and he brings them together. He reconciles them together and you're the key to that. See, if you weren't, then he'd just kill you. He, he could have angels floating around down here. Just, you know, he could have apparitions showing up in people's bedrooms and saying, be saved, be saved. But he, he didn't design it that way. He designed us as reconciliers. So we got to... Um, Understand this. In Luke 4, 18, 19, it says this, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And this is, this, this is cited again in, in Isaiah 61. And this is why the Jews do not like the New Testament, because it shows the fulfillment of the Old Testament in Jesus Christ. If they were to accept one verse in the New Testament, their whole thing would be ruined. They know that. 
They will not accept that New Testament, not even historically. We're talking about the Orthodox. You get some liberal Jews, you get some conservative Jews, and they'll get some of the writings of Josephus and other historians, and they'll say, well, this Jesus really existed, he was a good teacher. But other beyond that, no way, Jose. Because you see, here in Luke, it tells you about his ministry. It says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering a sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, he accomplished all that. And what's interesting is when on your own, and I always say on your own, and, and most people won't go on their own, but if you go to Isaiah and you read that, you'll know that there's a semicolon over there in Isaiah 61, and it, does, and it stops where Luke 4, 18 and 19 uh, stops, but then it goes further in Isaiah because it talks about his government, it talks about his judgment. And Jesus Christ said he was here not to judge, but to what? To save. He came here to save, not to judge. See, his ministry on earth was to save and to give that truth out. He knew his time didn't come yet to judge, but his time will come. Isaiah will be fulfilled in its entirety when he comes back and sets up his rule and his reign. Uh, also, through the Holy Spirit in Hebrews 9.14. Hebrews 9.14. Now, I guess the cold air can do two of I guess one of two things, amen? It can either keep you up or it can put you out, man. It'd be so comfortable, you just, just watch that stuff, amen? But amen, Sunday, hallelujah, Sunday morning, sometimes you'll, well, you know what you did Saturday night or early Sunday morning, that's why you're tired. Uh, Hebrews 9, 14 says this, we're talking about sacrificially offered himself through the Spirit. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through, now look at it, through the eternal spirit, offered himself without spot to God, purge your what? Conscience. Is that in there? You got the right chapter and verse? Let's say conscience. From what? From dead works to serve who? A living God. Now, what did that? The blood of Christ. He sacrificially offered himself through the spirit. It's just the way it is. In the sacrifice of himself, as in all else, Jesus Christ was directed by and dependent upon the Holy Spirit. And we're talking about that Holy Spirit in relationship with Jesus Christ, and we're seeing all the similarities between us and him down here. It's not about giving up. It's about growing up. Amen? That's good. Let me write that down. I could probably preach that one day. Wake up. It's not about giving up. It's about growing up. Amen. never know I forget that probably in Romans 8 11 we were already there but it's the resurrected power of the spirit with the relationship to Jesus it says but if the spirit of him that raised up and we just talked about this raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you and it says if amen if but if the spirit of of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you Jesus Christ was raised from the dead by the coordinate power of the triune God. That is, the Holy Spirit, therefore, had a prominent part in his resurrection. Uh, that's why when uh, all of a sudden uh, uh, the rapture takes place, somebody says, well, why are we the only ones going up? Well, we're the only ones going up because we got a spirit. Uh, we saw that uh, videos here a long time ago. If you remember, we probably have to do it again on Wednesdays. It would be sort of good after a struggling Christian, but we did a lot of moody. Uh, Bible Institute that was back in the 40s and 50s and 60s and that uh, scientist there when he went by and he was uh, showing how a couple of things looked exactly the same but they didn't have uh, um, they didn't have the, uh, um, the the carbon alloy in the metal if you looked at it you know they looked the same they reacted the same they sunk in water they did all these kinds of things and then all of a sudden lo and behold he comes by with a magnet and boom just that one thing goes up and then he used the scripture, you know, about the differences between Christians and the world. See, you'll be right next to the world. You look just like the world. And uh, next thing you know, you'll be walking along, and here comes the magnet, amen. You're gone, and they're here. What's the difference? Holy Spirit of God. Holy Spirit of God. Same power. Same power. He quickened your mortal, remember? 
he quickened your dead spirit. I mean, that's what he does. Um, we also have the commandment to the apostles, and I say that, I stress that to the apostles, after his resurrection, giving through the Holy Spirit, and that's in Acts chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Now, it's amazing to me how I'm still talking to people, and uh, they still can't see that Acts is a transitional book. Uh, you could take it for some historical uh, things, but going doctrinally, you better watch out. Uh, if you're saying doctrinally it belongs to the church, you have to watch out because it's a transitional book. What we mean about transitional, it's transportation. It is going from the Jew to the Gentile economy. It's moving from the law over to just the grace aspect of what Jesus has for us. Uh, you can know that by reading the book of Acts and seeing how complicated it would be to get the doctrine of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. Because you have six different ways. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, the, the apostle would speak and they would receive the Holy Spirit. Sometimes they lay hands to receive the Holy Spirit. Sometimes they got to be baptized and lay hands to receive the Holy Spirit. I mean, there's, a, there's six different ways to receive the Holy Spirit here. Now, the Pentecostal brethren want to take the baptism or whatever. They're only taking one of those six, see. And they're trying to be slick by mix, mix matching it around. But, and they don't like you when you start showing them those other five different ways. So what about this? What, why can't we get it this way? Why can't we get it that way? It's a transitional book. But nonetheless, the Holy Spirit had to come. There was a commandment of Jesus Christ when he was here. He said it was expedient for him to leave me. And the resurrection was going to happen. And the reason for that is the Holy Spirit was going to be given down here. And it could do a whole lot more than he could do in that body when he was here. And by that Holy Spirit getting in us, it works through each and every Christian and do the will of the Father. But in Acts 1, 1 and 2, it says this, The former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up. After that, he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. You know, to me, that's fantastic, just that wording. Did you hear what I said? He had given to the apostles whom he had chosen. Do you see that? So these guys that raise up say they're apostles today, they're not his apostles. They weren't chosen by him. Every time you read the book of Acts, every time you read the gospel, it's talking about those 12, those 12, those 12. And then it talks about them multiplying. And it talks about them confirming the word of God. And that's why the signs and, and gifts were given to them was to confirm the word of God because the word of God was not established yet. So the Holy Spirit came down. Jesus Christ seemed to have continued uh, under the direction of the Spirit in the work given to him by the Father until he had again taken his place at the right hand of God in complete exaltation. Amen. Now, also, Acts 2.33. In Acts one. And 1 and 2, we saw that the commandment to the apostles after his resurrection, given through the Holy Spirit. Now we're going to see the bestower of the Holy Spirit. The bestower of the Holy Spirit. And that's in Acts 2.33. It says, Therefore, being by the right hand of God, exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this, which you now see and hear. Who did that? Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost as a result of Christ's ascension and, and session at the right hand of God as our high priest. If you remember, he went and made those commandments. He stayed around for 40 days doing infallible proofs of his resurrection. Uh, we studied that about Christology. We, we proved that he was here. It was a historical fact that he was here. He did all those miracles. Remember the 500 plus people that were, that were uh, there? I mean, goodness gracious. You'd think that uh, all the writings, even of the Jews, they would have recorded that time when, when the tent was uh, uh, ripped in twain there and the rocks uh, cracked and, and burst open all over the place and the graves, remember that? Burst open and the dead came up and walked around. I mean... You know, we just think about that, but I mean, if you really think about that, that's hilarious. I mean, that was, that was not only scary, but that had to be the comedy, comedy show of Jerusalem. I mean, just watching that thing, I could just, I wish, sometimes you just wish people would make movies, something like that, because I could just, you know, I mean, really, come on, knock it on the door and your great-great-granddaddy or something knocks on there and tells about Jesus Christ, his resurrection and life. Now, these people had to go and die again. 
in that sense. You know what I mean? They had to go die again. We're not going to die again, but it's just the fact that Jesus Christ was showing, not only in type, they didn't have television, but I mean graphically in illustration, he gave an illustration of people coming up out of the grave. I mean, my goodness, people had, I bet they're bouncing into each other. They're going out of their mind. Especially the, the grave keepers. If they're out there keeping the grave, can you imagine them tombs, uh, the things opening up? That happened, people. That's what Matthew says happened. And when Jesus resurrected, this stuff all took place. I mean, I don't know about you, but that's pretty heavy duty. And it's recorded. I mean, it really happened. I mean, I told you folks about that coin that's out there. That, uh, uh, I don't know when that was. Was it Sunday night or I can't remember. But, but that's true. I mean, this stuff is happening. I mean, right now, you know. And, uh, and uh, uh, we, you know, and, and then you, you had, you, you're listening between the different political views now, and you're listening what a, uh, uh, what do you call it, a, a conservative is, what he ain't. I mean, you as a Christian already know what the, you're a Bible believer. I mean, you're a Bible believer. You already know what's right and wrong. I mean, you ought to get on the TV and say, this is what a Bible believer is, and this is what he ain't. That would do it. And uh, forget about conservative and liberal, be a Bible believer. That'll do it. But I think about that. If I'm a Bible believer and I think about that stuff that took place, my goodness. And I think about all the preaching I heard through my life and all the different, with Dr. Hag come with all the different things like that, uh, uh, prophetical things. And, and then you think about the world events of what's going on. And you think about, uh, I remember Hag doing that uh, deal on the uh, tornadoes and the hurricanes and, you know, how the devil does that. And according to the Bible, the devil moves that stuff around. See, we're thinking God moves that stuff around. That's the devil. This is world. He wants to destroy things. It's God that says, nope, to the left. Nope, up there. See, he controls. He's the outside control of everything, but he allows that, that, that devil domain. And we forget about that stuff. <laughs> We're thinking, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> if you remember, somebody had to ask God permission to get Job. And we often forget. I don't, I don't know who I was talking to. Was either Susanna or Susanna, I think, about uh, how parents need to pray for their children. Put a hedge around them. You know, is that still dispensationally now? Sure it is. Job was before all that stuff. When it talks about, remember the devil came to uh, uh, the God and he says, uh, yeah, but you got a hedge around him. <laughs> remember Job says he, he, gave, he gave his little, he made that altar and he, and he sacrificed for his own children. And you ought to read that and find out about that and find out why he did that. In case they forgot. He knew how powerful God was and how his judgment was. So in case they forget to do little things, Lord, would you please hear this, pr this person's prayer as a parent? And God kept a hedge around him. How do you know? Because he had to have permission to get his kids. Remember that? But see, as, as one that, and remember, he's also the one that says, uh, what, uh, worms may destroy this body or this flesh or something, but in this body I'll see God or something. I think Job said that too. He had the power of the resurrection in him. Strange thing, that book of Job. And here you got Christians, and they can't figure this out. God's not letting nothing happen to us, right, that doesn't go through his hands. He allows certain things to happen. Um, I don't like them. You don't like them. But bless God, recognize who's doing it, and at least you'll be able to give them thanks and not be, be full of bitter. Um, I think about this because the Holy Spirit has to do something in us to allow us to believe those things. Ain't that amazing? Because your flesh wants to retaliate, right? The mind wants to retaliate. Unless the Holy Spirit gives us power, we're, 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 just, we're just messed up. So you got the bestower of the Holy, Holy Ghost, amen? And we, we see that, and we know that it happened in Pentecost because of the very act of what took place when the Holy Spirit came here. Now we see the Holy Spirit also in relationship to scriptures. Go over to 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. The scary part is much that's given is much what? Required. I need to keep Brother George Stewart in prayer, too. Amen. I haven't got to see him yet, but he's real close to us here, I found out, so maybe I can get in and see him. You say, what are you going to do? Say you told, him, told you so? No way. 
That's stupid. He already knows what the deal is. Man, if anybody knows the ball game, much is given, much is required. I mean, there's, there's no preaching to George. He knows it all. And I don't mean that being smarty aleck. I mean, he preached it. He studied it. He knows the ball game. But what took place? The mind took over. I mean, can't you sense yourself when you're going away from the Lord? Come on. And it's like all of a sudden, it's like a battle going uphill. Almost a lot of times trying to stay with the Lord. It really is. It's like you're, it seems like you're going to lose. You're just doing this. You're just doing this, you know. You're just like you're, you're ever climbing. You know, then that spirit and your, your body's hating it. And your spirit's saying, go on, go on. You can make it. You make it. Well, you see, you're climbing. And eventually you're going to get raptured and go on up. Then that struggle won't be there anymore. That's a blessing. Or you die. And the struggles, you don't have to worry about that anymore. But you're going up like this. But a lot of times somebody will find a plateau. See? Are you, are you following me? You'll find a plateau, so you'll, it's a way of getting off real quick. So when you get off, and you're hanging there, that's when you're being drawn, see? Because somehow you got away from the fight and the struggle, and you got... See, it's easier. You see what I mean? Here's a struggle, and uh, all of a sudden, you get on the plateau. Well, now it's easy. You feel, wow, this is cool. And what'd you do? You let your guard down. There's no more fight in you. And it's not the Lord's rest. It's your rest. So when you rest like that, it's not but a few steps, you're off the other side. And as you go off the other side, see, you're being drawn away by your own lust. It's like a, it's like a snowball. Amen? And all that time, the Holy Spirit's still with you. It really is. So then what happens when you hit? Well, you, got, <laughs> you realize where, where it's really at is the fight is really where it's at. <laughs> So you just stay fighting. <laughs> See? Why? Because the Lord gives you a rest. So you rest in the belief <laughs> of the Bible. <laughs> I mean, you just rest in the book. Now it becomes real to you. You say, man, this is great. That's why all of a sudden while you're in the fight and everything, you get a second breath. Now, in, in the last 30 years, I've only got maybe two second breaths, amen? But I can remember them. One was with Spurgeon. We played basketball at the YMCA with a bunch of them street kids playing Detroit ball. Me and him ended up playing like football against these jokers, man. It was rough, man. I even had laterals. We dribbled down the thing, and I just stopped and just lateral to them. <laughs> you can't do that. So we're doing it, man. But I remember getting by that basket underneath the basket going, <gasps> I mean, I was burning so bad. I said, I'm dying. I'm just dying. Here I am, you know. Back then, I was probably 60 pounds overweight. I mean, I said, I'm dying. What a thing to do. I said, well, you know, let's think of the good part. I'm, we're playing with these street kids and trying to be fun, and preacher dies playing basketball with these kids. I said, well, that probably turned out all right. But all of a sudden, next thing you know, the burning went away. You know, and I was done sweating, all of a sudden I was like, wow, and I did it again. And, and I went longer than I did the first time. It was just amazing how that works, that second breath. But when you're serving the Lord, you have a lot of plateaus to get off. And really, they're designed, God allows those plateaus to be there. If you remember about the testing of your faith, is much precious, or is more precious than gold. The testing, so you got to get a hold about the testing, is more precious. Then you won't think it's uh, always chastisement or, oh my goodness, this is more than I can stand. Or you almost sound like Cain wandering around the earth, you know. My punishment is more than I, than I can stand. And it's an attitude that you get. And uh, that's crazy. But I said all that because it's got to do with the Holy Spirit and you learning, learning, learning about the Holy Spirit of God and what he's trying to do for you. He's trying to rip down your flesh put it where it belongs in a stinking grave because it ain't no stinking good and you need to depend on his holy spirit and when you do that you'll get the power you need and as you're going up you'll get your second third fourth different breaths as you're fighting as you're climbing up this thing as you struggle and uh, you're going to find out there's a power and there's a rest to god's people and it's in the scriptures it's a supernatural rest and uh, so the relationship of the holy spirit in the scripture starts off we see in second peter 1 20 21 it says, knowing this first, that, in other words, above everything else, understand that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So every word you have down there, every phrase or anything has been providentially preserved. It has been spoken by Almighty God. God is not going to give his word out there 
Uh, inspiration means God breathes. So when he put them words out there, every word was inspired. Every last word was inspired. And God is not going to let one word drop. He's got uh, that preservation power of his word. Because he told us to keep his word. He told us that freedom and peace comes from his word. He told us that power comes from his word. Uh, he, he, what kind of a God would not let you have his word? I mean, it would be stupid. It would be idiotic. Um, we believe that God, uh, English-speaking people didn't take God by surprise. Uh, we believe the threat uh, of this generation, generations to come, is to remove bits and pieces of the Word of God so that people won't have a clear, uh, concise idea of the doctrines of the Word of God about how they're supposed to live, act, think, talk, and walk. And eventually they're going to come back to private interpretation. Every Christian will come back to private interpretation, and that private interpretation will be done by the, by the so-called quote-unquote church, and the head of that church will be their, their pope, and that pope will dictate to everybody what is truth and what is the word of God, because everybody that's learned won't know, and everybody that's unlearned will go to the learned that don't know, and they're going to be confused, and so one dude's going to rule the roost again. It's just history repeating itself. Our liberty, our sanctity, our separation, everything in this country is due because of the Word of God. And so they know that. So when that, that eliminates, that's why people hate uh, the sovereignty. That's why uh, uh, you better watch them political parties that want us to mix with the UN. Everything's the UN. The UN's going to tell us what to, what to do in the world. The UN's going to do this. UN, no, no, no. We have sovereignty still. See, we believe as Bible believers that God give us this country. And, and bless God, if the other world can't keep along with us, that's, their, that's tough. We shouldn't have to lower ourselves to be with the world. You see, real freedom does come from this book, and it came from this country. And that's why God's blessed us. But as soon as you give it over to a bunch of heathens in the U.N., not one of them Christian. Not one of those nations Christian except us. And then you got the Jew, and that's it. They used to claim God. Now they got it out of their constitution. France, Spain. All these things that used to be for God, they're all coming out of the U.N. That's garbage, see? So we ought to fight that until we die, man. That's what we ought to do. One day you'll get that, or, or we'll, see, we'll see that all the preaching was, was right when we come under this, uh, this U.N. rule. It tells you how to uh, rear your kids, tells you what kind of guns you can have or not have, tells you where you can fish or not. Starts buying up all the land and then tells you you can't fish or you can't hunt on that land because they're natural resources and they keep buying up land, buying up land. Pretty soon they'll say, well, you don't need your weapons because you can't hunt or fish. See, they have a plan. Uh, whether you read enough or know enough or even go to the U.N. on the, on the stupid thing and read their constitution would be a nice thing. Read their amendments, what they believe. And then you look at 180 nations or wherever they got right there and you see who's over them. I'm Buddhist, Muslim. You see about all this kind of junk, all this works, works, works. There's no faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. They frown on us. They hate us. They call us Satan. And uh, the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit gave us this book. You see? And if you're saved and got the Holy Spirit of God in you, you know he gave you this book because it speaks to you. It does something for you. But what happens, like I say, most Christians will find a plateau and they'll give up their reading. They won't read. They won't pray. They won't do nothing. They're, they're resting on that plateau, see, and that's where the enemy is. So they lose their mind, they lose their emotions, and they lose their will. They have no will to even serve God. They're, they're robots of the devil. They're taken captive at his will. What a bummer. What a bummer. Well, who, who gets you out of that? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. All these people can do is preach the word, teach the word, but the Holy Spirit's the one that allows you to grow, allows you to get your act together, even allows you to know if you're off the right path. Holy Spirit does. Also, we know that in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. And uh, also here in 2 Peter, uh, once again, if you're here, let's go. I think it's about being born again in Christ. Let's see. Let me see. 2 Peter uh, chapter 3. <clears throat> and uh, 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse uh, 15 and 16. I believe it is. Let me see here. It says, An account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath what? Written unto you, as also in all his epistles. Those are his letters. 
speaking in them of these things in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest. See that? They that are unlearned and unstable rest. What do you mean they wrestle them? Wrestle them scriptures. As they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. Mm. Then Peter goes on to say, Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware lest ye also, lest ye also, being led away with the error of the wicked, see that? Fall from your own steadfastness. And then look what he tells you to do. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Isn't that good? Sure that's good. That's a good promise. But verse 17 is also a warn warning, and it talks about fall from your own steadfastness. And that's not too good a deal. Let me see what John 16, 13 says. John 16, 13. I got that in my notes. <clears throat> oh, yeah. John 16, 13 says, Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, is come... He will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Mm. He shall guide you into all truth. The scriptures represent the Holy Spirit as being the divine agent for the communication of the truth of God to men. This is definitely declared concerning the Old Testament scriptures and is clearly implied and stated concerning the new. You also have the Holy Spirit in relationship to the Scripture will interpret them, interpret them. Uh, the Bible says in Ephesians uh, 1.17, Ephesians 1.17, <clears throat> it says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. That's what it says. Talking about the Holy Spirit in relationship to the Scriptures, it interprets Scripture for you. It helps you. See, man's impotency to interpret truth already revealed is just as marked as his inability to communicate the revelation apart from the aid of the Holy Spirit. What are you saying? I'm saying that you and your flesh are impotent. You have no power, no power with the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit has to be in you as a saved person, and that Holy Spirit reveals truth to you, because on your own you have no truth. And so that's where the assurance comes for your salvation. Uh, that's where the learning of Scripture is for anything, uh, the rapture, judgment, tribulation, uh, any of these things are not just a head knowledge. It is the possession of the Holy Spirit of God in you that reveals that to you. And when you get it, you got it, because the Holy Spirit's there. The scriptures were given by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and their true interpretation is only possible through his illumination. That's why a lot of people go through a lot of difficulty and they get the scriptures and boom, the scripture illuminates to them, gives them peace, gives them sound mind, gives them power. Uh, we do it uh, as Christians, just like as in the human realm, you get up, you eat, you got your breakfast, your lunch, your dinner, whatever you eat, you feed your body, you feed your face. Uh, we do it out of habit, we do these things, but if we really stopped and thought, uh, uh, of a lot of the nutritional value, value that we do get from the food that we eat, that's what sustains life. So as a Christian, uh, we read that Bible, we pray, we read that Bible, we pray, we study, we, we hear preaching, we get preaching on tapes, we just uh, get saturated with this stuff because we know for some reason there's a connection between our spiritual growth, our spiritual well-being, and uh, this Word of God right here. And you'll know it because, you'll know the difference because when you stop listening to preaching, when you stop learning that Bible, when you stop reading that Bible, you die inside. It's like you're dying inside. You become malnutritioned. And then when you think of being malnutrition, you think about all the things that come with malnutrition, amen? Uh, you, you know, you scratch, you get, you get messed up skin, you get your eyesight gets messed up, your organs aren't working properly, I mean, your, your mind's not thinking. And when you're malnutrition, uh, you're actually killing yourself because you're not feeding yourself properly. Now, a Christian once saved is always saved, but if you don't put the proper nutrition in your soul... If you stop doing what you used to do, you're going to start losing that love for the Lord. You'll start getting more and more and further and further apart. And then pretty soon that devil will be able to convince you of anything. And uh, 
That's why you have to watch. I told you before about certain drugs that you take. Understand what the relationship of those drugs and uh, what it does to you, what it does to your mind. And uh, watch out about that stuff. And uh, I'm sure I'm sure you know this this kind of thing already. Um, let me see another. I'm going to go to another scripture here, that interpretation of scripture. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Let me see what this says here in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. First Corinthians chapter 2 and verse uh, 9 through 14. Good scriptures. You understand about the interpreting of scripture and the illumination of scripture by these verses because there's no way your human mind can comprehend these verses without the power of God. It says, but as it is written, see that? As it is written, it's in the word. I, you know, it's probably Jeremiah 3, 3, 3. I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God, see that? But God, you're not going to get this without him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. For the spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now, we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us. You notice how many times the Spirit of God is mentioned. Look at verse 13. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual now, here's the difference, and this proves it without a doubt, that if you're not receiving spiritual things, if you're not getting any inferences or anything from God, if you don't know anything about God, there may be a good indication you are lost. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. That's why a lot of these people walk around and they got a lot of head knowledge. They got off of somebody, borrowed it from somebody, read something somewhere, memorized a lot of things in their brain, but God's not giving nothing in their soul. They're not getting any information. Nothing's clicking in there, man. There's good indication there's nobody home. Amen? A lot of times people will, will hear the word of God and they'll, they'll, they'll think they got it, but remember the Bible talks about the devil coming and plucking the word out of them before it gets settled. A lot of people be in church and they'll say, oh man, that's it, that's it. And then they'll leave church and that's it. They never really received it, never really got it in there because they allowed the devil to come in and just take it out. You ever read that in the scripture? The devil's good at that, taking the word of God out of you. <laughs> Tell you what, it's dangerous. Amen. Lord, Lord, we've cast out devils in your name and the Lord said what depart from me workers of iniquity I knew you not amen what keeps me going that book man that Holy Spirit that assurance I get man as the devil bombards my brain I get in that book what else do you do I get I got tapes in there man I listen to preaching tapes man I throw them on there why do you do that because I just got to have it I'm not spiritual like other people super spiritual they don't want the only time they get any stuff is in church that's it. They don't listen to Christian music. They don't listen to Christian talk. I mean, they don't listen to preaching. They don't do nothing, man. They just come to church, get a little bit here, an hour here, half hour there, 45 minutes there. I wonder why they don't have any rewards, even down here. Well, you're not understanding the way the Spirit works. The Spirit's trying to help you. He's trying to talk to you. He really wants to take over, but you got to give it. you got to give in, give over to him. Then he'll start opening up doors for you to minister. He'll start giving you some peace. He'll give you some ideas on how to get people saved. I mean, the Holy Spirit's a wonderful, wonderful thing. And we thank God that uh, we're sealed with that Spirit. All right, that's it. That's it for a while. Five, two, and get back to about... Sometimes if a preacher got up and preached out of something else, you wouldn't know it. Well, that sounds like Scripture. Yeah. <laughs> or I could just make up Mary had a little lamp with these and thousands in there, and you'd say, Amen, brother, preach from the King James Bible. And if you're not faithful over the word of God that God gave you, over the knowledge God gave you, how is God going to give you other talents? 
You know, it's like the servant coming and saying, you know, when I was here, I taught you this, this, and this. And I'm so excited because when I came back, you knew twice as much. You were faithful with the knowledge. Holy Spirit's not going to reveal any more to you or show you any more in the Scripture if you're not going to be faithful with what God has already given you. He's not going to show you. He's not going to demonstrate to you because you're not faithful to it. I had a deacon tell me his philosophy on marriage. Very biblical. And he said this. I guess I can get... It's good that I'm preaching. I get some of these off my chest so I don't get too much trouble when I get back. But this is what he said. We're in a meeting. It's just a closed little meeting. Me and seven deacons. Praise God. Um, and, and we're just talking. And he says, this is my philosophy on marriage. If it, There's two types of marriages. One made in heaven and one made on earth. And he says, if it makes it, it was made in heaven. If it doesn't make it, it was made on earth. So, well, glory. I said, so if I trade mine in, <laughs> I'm just looking for one made in heaven. Yeah. <laughs> and I get to keep going to one last uh, die, I guess. And then I know it's made in heaven. I said, what about sin? I said, sin enters the marriage made in heaven and it becomes a marriage broken. Because God says, the Word of God says, whatsoever man is joined together, let not... Whatever, so God put together, let not man put asunder. And he said, well, I'm just telling you what I think. <laughs> and, and so the saga goes on. But if you're not faithful, I mean, how, how can you be faithful so my, my question is, and some of y'all might have the same, same philosophy. See, the hardest thing with growing up in the Word of God and, 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 and trying to learn the Word of God is some things I've learned before may not be right. And so when God says, it ain't right, and I say, well, I don't, I don't, I, I, yeah, I, I see that. Uh, you know, I ain't, I ain't, yeah, but, you know, what do you want me to do? I got to go on. I'm Baptist. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, I know the Word of God might say something, but that, you know, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm, I am what I am. But we do that, and we're not faithful, and we bear that talent, and we shut off God telling us more, yeah. God showing us more, God doing in our lives. We shut it off. And, Barry, and he's coming a long time. He came back to reckon. I want you to know, I, I, I believe this one thing. You connect this, whatever. But I want you to know the Lord is coming back. Yes, and, and, and the thing is, we don't believe it as much as we need to believe it. Yes, sir. Because I would be doing a whole lot more knowing I was going to be reckoned soon. Yes, sir. Anyone ever been reckoned? <laughs> Here we're going. We're going to just, well, let's lay it out on the table. Let's see if you did what you needed to do. Let's see if it matches up to where you need to be. I am so bad with names. I couldn't name... Not very many in here. Um, I couldn't even... I, I don't know who these guys are. But uh, uh, I, names are just bad. I've taken a church history class. And, and it comes to the reckoning. I love it. love church history. I love reading about it. And, and, and I, I can remember the stories. But then I can't remember if it was Wycliffe or Knox or some other John or some other person. or some, I can't put it together. And it comes to the reckoning and I'm like, can we do this orally? So I, you know I know some of this. But they're like, here's a here's hundred names. You just match it with what they did. And I'm like, my Lord, at least it's multiple choice. <laughs> I could have to write the names in. And you know, on most of them, I got down, I'm like, it's between him or him. And I wanted to write that in there. It's either A or B. You know, and, and, and I've had church history one, and, and I'm on church history two. And you know what's funny about it? Those have been my first two worst class. And, 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 and I won't tell you the grade, but it, it, ain't, it ain't very high. It's not that I didn't learn. It was just when the day of reckoning came, he wanted me to tell back all the names. And I'm like, I can't. 
You use notes to give the lecture. Why can't I use notes to take the test? I think it'd be only fair. He doesn't remember it all, but he wants me to. And, and so, but I, I couldn't. I want you to know, though, if I really believed, and, and when that midterm's coming, what do you do? Oh, man, got to get this in. Got to get to this in. Right up to the time. And you're trying to keep all the names right. And you go and you're like, okay, they're gone. But what if we really believed God was coming back? And a day of reckoning was really going to transpire. And I'm standing here with five talents that God had given me to use while he was gone. And I'm like, okay, he's coming back. If I really thought he was coming back, I'd be really doing something about the five talents I had. You know, if God wanted me to sing and I thought he was coming back and I hadn't sung in a long time... Y'all couldn't get me off the stage. No, look, i got to use these talents as much as I can to bless somebody because he's coming back for a reckoning. You know, if I, if I knew I had a gift to teach and I could teach, I, I'd be, Lord, let me teach somebody because the day of reckoning is going to come. And if I knew I had the Word of God, I'd be in there, Lord, teach me a little more, teach me a little more because I know the day of reckoning is coming. See, folks, we live and verbally where we say the day of reckoning is coming, but we live as if it's not ever going to reach us. But you know, the neat thing about it is, if you're saved, the day of reckoning is not whether I'm getting to heaven or not. It, it's, it's about rewards. Now, we like payday down here, don't you? If there wasn't a payday, you wouldn't show up to work. We like payday down here. I like getting paid. And if you don't like getting paid, just give it to me one week and you'll begin to like it. No, we all like it. And, and, and somehow we miss it. I, I want to serve God because I love Him. That, I want that to be my ultimate goal. But you know what's so fascinating all the way through Scripture? God keeps telling me on how He wants to reward me. And somehow we, some, we get kind of confused. Don't serve them for the rewards. Just serve them because you love them. Well, God keeps saying, you know, you know what, you're going to be tried as by fire. And that if you're faithful, you get a crown for this. And you get a crown for that. Well, why'd God tell me all that? Why? Because he knew I needed a little more motivation than just saying, I love God. Because I can't love him nearly as much as he loves me. But he does know we all got a little bit of selfishness in us. We got all got a little bit of I want in us. And so I tell you what, if, if you just you get in there to serve God, God one day is going to give back. And I don't know about you, I don't want to get to heaven. And stand before God. And everyone else has something to cast at his feet. I love you, Lord. And I'm there going, I have nothing. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want to have nothing. And, and I think a lot of times when we walk around saying, well, I'm just serving them because I love them, is the biggest cop-out we got going. Because we do a lot of things saying, well, I just love them. And we don't really mean it. We don't put anything to it. That day of reckoning's coming. Folks, and, and I want to be able to do something to cast at his feet. Read on with me. I'm almost done, I think. Verse 20. He got five. And look at verse 21. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. I often wondered about that. I chased that down several times. And, uh, but, you know, what are we entering into the joy of the Lord? You're faithful. Now let's enter into the joy of the Lord. I don't know about you. Sometimes down here it gets real joyful too. The joyfulness is just knowing I, being used by God. Being able to influence someone's life. I had a phone call right before I come from a, 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 a new Christian. Her husband's not even saved, but he's close. He's, 
he's uh, even this has made him where he wants to come to church more when I'm there. <laughs> you, you, know, you, you often wonder when a fight starts, lost people are lining up on your side too. It's kind of kind of strange when Christians can't see the word, but even lost people are seeking. God says, "Well, that's what it says. Let's just do." But you know, get saved first, okay? I mean, you got to work on. But you know what? She called and having difficulty. And it, and, it, and and you know what's neat is 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 who am I? Who am I? I, you know, I, I'm five hundred some miles away. But the neatest thing in the world is to know that somehow I'm trying to be faithful with the little talents I have just so we can be used for the kingdom of God. Guess what? God could have gave her an answer. But you know what I praise God for? He allowed me to give the answer from His throne. See see, see the purpose of the talent? You know what amazes me? Is every time I get done talking with someone, I'm like, I said nothing. And sometimes I'll get a card and say, Man, you help more than you ever know. I'm like, I didn't say anything. But who said something? Yeah. King of kings, Lord of lords. And guess what? All I do is take the talent he gave. God, let me be faithful in doing it. Come to a difficult time one time, uh, it was about three years ago. And I told the church, I said, this is what the word of God says. I said, find something to give me an out because I really don't want to do it. And I said, if you can find an out, I'll take the out. But if there is no out, I can't just ignore it. See, faithful to this, not to a whim. They say you'll hurt people. And I know this sounds strange, but in a sense, I don't care. Why? Because i got to do what the Lord says. Now, emotionally, I care that someone gets hurt. I like to be like Moses. Lord, don't kill them all. <laughs> it doesn't look bad. But God says just stand faithful in the talents that you have. You know, sometimes and you teach kids, Sometimes you wonder if it goes anywhere. And then they get older, and, all, and, and some of that comes back, and you're like, when did I do that? It's because you make it, you're using the talents. And the guy with two talents was blessed in the same way. But look at what happened to the guy with one. Now, I believe this person wasn't even saved. Well, the rest of the parable pretty much says he was wicked and slothful and God turned him off to hell, so it's, it's not a very big guess. It's pretty much a clear indication of, of what he is, but God left room in case you want to disagree with Scripture. Um, his Lord said unto him, no, look at uh, verse 24, Then he which said, had received one talent, came and said, now, now listen to this, because I want you to see a head knowledge versus a heart knowledge. Lord, I knew thee that thou art an hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, gathering where thou hast not strong. What, what, what's he saying? He's saying, uh, and, and see, this is where you've got to have a heart for God, above the head. Now, they're connected. And in the, in the, the Jewish didn't believe there was a separation between the heart and the head. Uh, they believed it was one. In America, we separate the heart and the head. You ever notice in Deuteronomy where it says, Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and strength, right? And then in the New Testament, because he's dealing with Gentiles, he says, Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, strength, and mind. Now, the heart was the mind. You know, you, you, they're connected things. And so understand, in the New Testament, he kind of added it because we've kind of changed the thinking. It wasn't that he added something to it. It was just the way it needed to be comprehended. Because God, more than anything, wants us to comprehend His Word, not just say, I have it. He wants us to be able to take it into our hearts and our souls and our minds and be able to stand on it. But this person had a head knowledge. And he says, I know you do things 
where you haven't even worked and it comes up. I know you work and function. I know you bless. I know you're a God that does miracles. And I know you heal. And I know you strengthen. And I know you guide. And I know all these things. But I hit it. Now, how, 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 where's, our, where's our faith? I spent 11 days with a guy from Ghana, Africa. And uh, amazing man. I was sharing this earlier, but I, I want you to, when, when I was talking to him on the phone, I told him, look, we can't do this. I, I don't. He says, I'm praying it'll work out. And he went for his visa like two weeks after the bombing to come to America. And Ghana really doesn't give out all that many visas anyway. And I says, well, you know, you know, wonder if you don't get the visa. This is what he says. That is not what I'm praying. I'm like, what do I say now? <laughs> that ain't what I'm praying. All right. See, when we pray, Lord, heal me. And we get up and we're, oh, I'm going to die tomorrow. <laughs> Lord, take care of my financial needs. Oh, I'll be poor bankruptcy tomorrow. Huh? He's like, that ain't what I'm praying. God says, ask whatever you want in His will, believing. And guess what? We'll be done. It's not prosperity theology. Because His will's in there. It ain't according to my will. Because according to my will, well, I'd have a whole lot more. But it's according to His will. And James clearly says, don't pray it amiss. But to pray to, you know, unto God, to God to be blessed and honored, glorified. That's the means. But he just said, that ain't what I'm praying. And you know what? They usually take an hour sometimes to some people when they talk to them in the U.S. Embassy in Ghana. Had his appointment. He went in there. They asked him three questions. Pretty much just said, who are you? Showed him his passport. Answered the question, who's your family? Told him his family and all that's going on, and show you his faith even more. They said, how do you know you're, you're going to come back? He said, here's my plane ticket. Got a return flight. And they said, all right. Gave him five-year visa. Huh? Five-year visa. They usually give 90 days. Here's a five-year visa. So now he can come back and forth, and, and he wants to get some churches built over there and gone and thing. But the thing is, folks, I want you to know this guy with one talent said, God, you do things miraculous. But I hid my talent. And sometimes, God, you, you work miracles. But I can't do it. And look what, look what happens. I, we, we won't get into the lost part. But his Lord answered and said, verse 26, Thou wicked and slothful servant, and he repeats back his words. Thou knewest that I reap where I sow not and gather where I have not strong. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers. And then at my coming, I should have received my own with usury. See, my question is, are we really dividend seekers for God? Do we really believe God can save. We pray for someone to get saved, but then we don't really believe that salvation is going to transpire. We believe that God can lift up and heal, but we never really seek a healing. Now, everyone's not going to get healed. The professor, I love what he said. He has cancer now. And so I, I thought, think of it often. Before he had cancer, he often would say, he says, if, if I'm ever deathly sick, and he is now, he says, if you're not going to pray believing, don't even come and pray. Because us Baptists are real notorious for going, well, we're going to pray God to heal you. And then right at the end of the prayer, 
I know we got to pray for God's will, but we don't pray God's will for it to be God's will. We pray God's will because we're doubting God's will. Aren't we? Because we want to cover ourselves. Lord, you can heal them, but your will in that way. Well, you know, if you're not healed, I don't look bad either. <laughs> my, my prayer got through. It's just, you know, it wasn't God's will. And I want you to know God uses sickness and has brought a lot of people to Him for the sickness. Not everyone's going to get healed. I'm amazed that sometimes our church, we have a person with a had a bad knee. Had, matter of fact, had his knee replaced. It's been several years ago. Had his knee replaced. He's worried about it because they wear out after so many years. And he went to his doctor, and his doctor said, well, it's just wore out. Got to put a new one in. Dreading it. Felt led one night. Not a faith healer by any means. There was two or three people in our church. I said, let's just really pray and ask God to heal. You know, when he woke up Monday morning, and his knee was fine. We don't talk about it much at the church because, you know, someone to think we might be in the faith healing mm -hmm. you know it's been two or three years now and and we don't we don't say god healed him of the knee we got a guy when i came there six months when i came he was supposed to die six months after i was there still living no sign of cancer mm -hmm. now understand it ain't my prayer But we got to wake up to the point, in fact, and understanding that we got to start praising God more for what He's doing and not just say, well, it wasn't God's will. And I guarantee, if you're on your deathbed tomorrow, it, God's going to do something in or through it. He may heal you or He may use your life as a bigger testimony for His honor and for His glory as you're going through it. But folks, we got to get from the intellect to the heart. we got to stop saying God can and will and does and, and, and start saying, it's going to happen. We've got to be people again that walk around and say, that ain't what I'm praying. And by faith, I'm trusting God is going to do something. Now, I know I want His will. And I don't want anything outside His will, and that's mine. That should be our everything about us. But He says, come believing. And when the apostles couldn't heal someone, what did he say? This fire doesn't go out but what? Prayer and fasting. See, we, don't, we, we don't, definitely don't want to fast anymore. I called our church to fast. Kind of worked out in a nice situation. We actually fasted for 24 hours. I said, sundown to sundown, whole church fast. We'll have a... Uh, and then we had a communion service, Lord's Supper, on a... I don't know what y'all call it. But anyway, on a Saturday night. Just cover it all on, on, on a Saturday night. And uh, 12 of us had a good time. 12 of us had a great time in the Lord. Tell you what, guess what? If, if it wasn't the Lord's Supper going on, but some potluck, and we weren't fasting, but celebrating, we could have packed the place. Well, I don't know about you, I actually wanted to move a little from my intellect to my heart. And if I really believe God can do, I better start acting like He will do. I'll give you a little last thing. That guy that came there, Mustafa, he left his home two days before the visa because he had to drive, packed to come to America, ticket in hand, knowing that after he did that two days later, He'd be in a crawl on a plane flying over here. You know, when I read of Moody, Billy Sunday, all of the giants of a revival era, guess what? They believed. D.L. Moody, the story is, where if you go there now where, it, where it's located, he actually walked off those blocks and prayed that God would put a school there. And guess what? There's a school there. But you know where my mind always goes? Why didn't go a couple more blocks? Why limit? Huh? But at least he went a couple blocks. So we say we have talents. And we're looking to serve the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Let me ask you. Have you buried it? 
Are you willing to use it for the kingdom of God? Let's stand.